Okay. How you did all of that. Hey, good yeah. evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Kevin with Via Media. My guest tonight is Jana Moore Lone. And oh my goodness, do I have an introduction? So a couple things. Let's uh, get a little a biography out of the way. Jana holds a BA in philosophy from the University of Massachusetts, a JD from George Washington University Law School, an MA and PhD in philosophy from the University of Washington, which begs the question for me, when did you have time to think? Uh, that, is, that is a lot of degrees. That's amazing. Uh, Jana is currently an affiliate of, uh, associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Washington and the director and co-founder of Plato Philosophy, Learning and Teaching Organization. Jana is the founding editor in chief of the journal Questions, Philosophy for Young People um, of the and also of the textbook Philosophy and Education, Questioning and Dialogue in Schools and the author of two amazing books, the first the Philosophical Child, and the second, and you're going to have to help me with this title, Seen and Not Heard, which the not is blurred out. So my question, first question for you before I allow you to say hello to everybody is like, how do you pronounce the title of this book? Oh, just as you did, Seen and Not Heard. Seen and Not Heard. It's supposed to get you to think about the not. All right. So I, I want to pronounce it seen and heard because of that. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, philosophy with children. Jana, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It's an uh, absolute delight to talk with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. OK, so I want to also introduce the conversation with a couple things. Number one, um, thank you so much for all the work that you do with schools uh, everywhere. I've experienced that personally, um, and my daughter is a wonderful benefactor as a result, and so is my nephew at the school uh, that they attend. Uh, second, uh, my daughter, my nine-year-old daughter, just this morning as I was preparing for tonight, asked me the question randomly, Dad, what if we're all in a coma? And we're actually not real. And we're just living as an imagination of somebody else's dream. And I was just thrilled and delighted at this question from my nine-year-old daughter. Uh, she knows that we think about all sorts of things in addition to theology, philosophy, and, and physics and stuff. And I was just so delighted at that question as I was getting ready to chat with you. Um, and so I also want to ask you, what do you think about the simulation hypothesis that we are all just merely... No, we won't get... We won't get there. Uh, we, we can talk about that later. What I want to talk about tonight is uh, this thesis, this hypothesis that you have put forward that we really should be talking about philosophy with children, which I uh, was stunned by. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And oh, do I wish more people would just simply pick up this book, read it in its entirety, parents, teachers, educators, etc., so that we can apply uh, this kind of approach and thinking to our pedagogy, our parenting, raising of our kids, etc. So let me start with a basic question. Given all of this work that you have done and the publications that you have, what is philosophy and why teach it to children, Jana? Well, um, there are many, many definitions of philosophy, as I'm sure you know, and philosophers continue to argue about what philosophy actually is. But at base, I think most, if not all of us, would agree that it is reflection and study and discussion of unsettled big questions in life. Um, philosophical questions, I think by definition, remain contestable. So there are questions about which we might have many possible answers, uh, and there are many ways to look at them, and they require a lot of perspectives in order to sort of get at making any progress in thinking about questions such as, you know, what does it mean to be a friend or what is real mm. or what or how do we know if um, that goodness is important or what is a community, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. OK. Um, why teach it to children, uh, which is kind of implied with the question that children really can't do this kind of thing. I mean, I, I'm yeah. so sorry to quote Princess Bride, which I have to do in every single talk that I apparently give. But have you ever heard of Plato, Aristotle and Socrates? Right. They're morons. Right. <laughs> I mean, this is these these kinds of questions that you're suggesting is part of philosophy lives uh, I think culturally, in the ivory tower, right? It, it lives in a place where really smart, erudite, studied, educated people wrestle with. Children are 
not the audience for this. So make the case, which I think you really brilliantly do in, in your work, for why we can do this or should do this with children. So I guess first, there's an implicit assumption in what you, the way in which you just asked me. The oh, yes, question, please. And that is that philosophy is studying philosophers is engaging in philosophical thinking and writing and discussion just in the way that is done in the ivory tower in academia. And of course, that is one way and an important way to do philosophy. But philosophy by its nature is not just that. Philosophy is simply thinking about these big questions. And all of us who teach and or parent young children know the children are already asking these questions. Mm -hmm. They think about these kinds of big life questions from pretty early on. One of the reasons I became interested in this work is I, at the time, had a four-year-old who was starting to ask questions like, are numbers real? Mm -hmm. Though That's a big philosophical question, and it's not unusual for children around that age to be asking and thinking about those kinds of questions. And so I think it's important for a number of reasons. One, because as I said, children are already thinking about these questions and they often don't get a lot of uptake from the adults around them when they start to ask them. Either we say, oh, how cute or adorable, or we kind of laugh at them, or we think, oh, you can't possibly understand what you just asked. And so children, I think, often then stop asking the adults in their lives these questions because mm. they get the message they're not gonna be taken seriously. Yeah. Um, but I think children are sort of um, particularly disposed to philosophical thinking mm. because they are newer to the world. So they don't approach these questions with this kinds of, of uh, layers of assumptions that adults have about what we already know. Children are aware that there's a lot of things they don't know. And they're really willing to kind of throw themselves into thinking about questions like these without the sort of layers of resistance, maybe you might say, that adults might find. But I guess even more importantly, children, I think, really benefit from a space in which they can think together about questions that don't have settled answers because so much of school is answer centered mm. and children are constantly trying to figure out what it is the teacher wants them to say what is the answer to this question that is correct that they should give and that's fine but there really also need to be spaces in which children can think their own thoughts and can think out loud without fear that they're going to get it wrong and of course, one of the things we want them to learn in philosophy is that some answers are better than others because they de it depends on the reasons you're giving. So we help them to think about why, mm. why do you think this? Mm. Uh, one of the things kids will say to me often is it's a lot easier to say what you think than why you think it, mm. which we all know is exactly right. But we are helping them to know why they think what they do. And when you know why you think what you do and you're able to articulate the reasons for your views, that gives you a lot of both skill and confidence in expressing mm. yourself mm. and in thinking clearly. And I, I don't know that there are more important things for young people than those gifts. Oh, my goodness. You covered a whole bunch of stuff that I wanted to talk <laughs> about. So I, let me go back. I, I, loved, sure. I, I loved all of that. One of my questions that arose was how in the world did we get to the place where I as a child are asking these profound questions and then as I grow older I now think that those questions are cute or irrelevant and you kind of alluded to one of the ways in which that happens is that our our very pedagogy the very educational system that we have developed has shifted from open-ended philosophical inquiry curiosity to answers and getting the test right. Um, so is there more to explore there? Because I think teasing out how, I mean, we're talking about children. We were all children at one particular point that, you know, got educated out of us, this level of curiosity. So is there anything more that we should understand about how that shift happens? Yeah, I mean, I think part of that is a kind of growing self-consciousness. It becomes 
maybe shameful to say you don't know or you have a question mm -hmm. it's showcasing that there's something you know you're ignorant about as opposed to there's something interesting to be curious about mm -hmm. i think that actually many adults do hold on to wonder and curiosity but maybe not express it as freely as mm -hmm. children do because we are so much more self-conscious about how we might be perceived about whether we sound smart enough or sophisticated enough or whatever and young children they just don't care about that at all yeah. they're they're you know well that gets to this other element that i think is again so uh wonderfully insightful but really difficult um you mentioned it in your previous answer but you also write about this on page 15 of the philosophical child you write what we might characterize as their naivete becomes a strength as they examine many possible answers to the endless puzzles of philosophy. And it seems as if what you're doing is making a case that the naivete of childhood is an, an incredible value that we should not let go of that is beaten out of us culturally or just taken away from us as a result of that growing conscientiousness. Is, am I hitting right on the, the direction of what you're, you're thinking here? Yeah, I think so. I think that there's a kind of a freshness of perspective that we have as children that lends itself really well to philosophical thinking because philosophy demands that we think about things imaginatively, that we come up with hypotheticals to try and tease out these questions that are so complex and difficult and that there are so many ways to see. And children are really good at that. They're really good at trying out potential scenarios and thinking about possibilities in a way that adults often are constrained more by our, our sort of inner fear of, as I say, either the way we're perceived or that we might be missing something that everyone else knows and, you know, those kinds of anxieties yeah. and worries. Yeah, it's interesting. And in some of the, the work that I've done in like organizational psychology, it's, it's the people that can sometimes admit that they don't know that gains a level of credibility um, to their positions of the things that they do know. So it's interesting that um, there's this weird cultural paradox where the idea of knowing everything and being smart in the room seems to have value, but yet what also has value is recognizing you don't know everything and you can learn from uh, other uh, people and other uh, situations, circumstances, etc. So, Yeah, it really is about the importance of <clears throat> questions, right? Being comfortable with questions, liking questions, being willing to try things out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I and I do that. think that's a that's really a strength of lead, of good leaders too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, and this oh gosh, this is why I loved your work so much by thinking through the ways in which children do philosophy. It can inspire those of us who are no longer quote unquote children to reclaim that which is naturally a part of who we are, and that could radically shift our identities our relationships our organizations etc right um this is the absolutely thing I, love. I mean i think in my experience philosophy is never as playful with other adults as it is when i engage in it with children You're right because they're just so open to that and then that part of me is able to sort of emerge in a more powerful way right it's one of the gifts of doing this work with children is that we're able to kind of reconnect with that part of us that I think we all really appreciate in children yeah. and value in them, right? Yeah. Okay, so you also mentioned this uh, fundamental philosophical, like, like meta-philosophy, that philosophy is about open-ended questions and inquiry and, and uh, a curiosity. And there's a part of me that wants to argue with you from the kind of the academic perspective that says, but wait a second, Jana, there are there are answers in the world like math, chemistry, physics, like you are going to get some things right and you're going to get some things wrong. And if we're going to teach STEM, if we're going to ensure that the next generation of engineers and scientists, et cetera, are going to work in this world uh, appropriately, then we need to make sure that they get those answers. Talk to me about this tension that I think exists. I'm, you know, I'm in Silicon Valley here that mm -hmm. exists between, quote unquote, the hard sciences and the soft sciences and philosophy. And I've even heard some physicists um, 
popular physicists argue that philosophy is actually irrelevant and unneeded uh, because yeah. it's really all about physics, right? So there, talk to me about that tension uh, there. I mean, I really think that's a false binary. Honestly, I think, of course, it's important for us to have certain knowledge, for us to understand mathematics, have basic basic skills in, in a whole range of areas, right? I'm not arguing that all we should do all day is wonder about philosophical questions, for example, although it's fun to do some <laughs> days, uh, but rather that this is also an important part of being an educated person. And actually, I think many scientists notwithstanding, you know, people who are arguing, you know, philosophy's dead or whatever. I mean, we've been hearing that for, what, how many hundreds of years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think most scientists argue that actually questioning is a, is a, at the core of scientific inquiry, mm -hmm. right? That, that those, that being, a, being comfortable to ask questions is part of what makes for progress in science. And, and it, as it's true in most disciplines, I think many scientists and other uh, social scientists would say, the more you know, in fact, the more you realize you don't know and mm. the more questions you have. Yeah. Well, that's a, a level of epistemic humility that I wish more would, <laughs> would attain to. Um, you are arguing that children can do this. They automatically do this. Adults should create a kind of environment in which philosophical inquiry from children is welcomed and, um, and encouraged. Uh, talk to the person who says, but I don't want my child to talk about uh, tragic or difficult things like death or evil or bad things happening. I don't want to traumatize my child. These are hard questions. And are there age appropriate levels at which you engage with these kinds of questions? Right. And I guess they're, they're, the kind of central answer to that is you're not like doing content delivery here. You're not coming in and saying, OK, my child, today we're going to talk about death. <laughs> right? You're responding to your child's comments and questions. So, and if you have a child who says to you, you know, I really wonder all the time about why people have to die or what happens after death, this is a way to engage in, in a conversation with them. Mm. It's not about introducing topics that may be scary for children or uncomfortable for them because it's really not up to you to introduce the topic in the first place. We're really trying to be responsive to the questions we hear children asking. Part of this is being able to listen and hear them mm. because so often mm. they go unnoticed, right? So it's really paying attention to what really is my child asking or saying. And the more you're able to kind of pick up on that, the more comfortable the child is gonna to be to continue to ask those kinds of questions out loud rather than sort of pushing them away because of the fear that they won't be taken right. up in right. any respectful way. I, I feel like we need to emphasize that for for people because I, I think there there mm -hmm. is a fear. I mean, parenting is just fraught with all sorts of fears and anxieties and concerns, Absolutely. right? And so, and so when a child asks this question and let's say a relative recently passed away or something and they're asking these questions, I think that it's very impulsive or there's this natural impulse for many of us to want to dismiss the question and to move on to happier more joyful things like isn't childhood supposed to be fun and games and you know uh playing with toys and you know th that kind of thing like why why bog down childhood with all of these existential questions you know usually what i say to people when they and i do get asked questions like this uh relatively frequently right. um is think about when you were a child I mean, yes, childhood ideally is full of play and joy and fantasy and wonder, but it's also full of being part of the world and coming into the world and seeing that there are a lot of things that are very puzzling yeah. and that you think about. And I think that one of the things we don't want to do in our efforts to protect and nurture children is to dismiss their curiosity and intellectual capacities for thinking about these larger questions, because it's also a part of childhood, yeah, I believe. Yeah. I also think that part of the uh, strategy that you are, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> advocating for, so, so sorry about that, uh, that you're advocating for is to ensure that when the 
child asks you a question, when a question is asked of you as the adult, you don't become the answer person. You you write about being a co-inquirer with your child, very different from doing, quote, academic philosophy. The, the adult is not the expert. So uh, talk to us about the strategy, the emotional posture that uh, parents and adults and teachers need to have to achieve that goal. It's a great question. I mean, because a lot, I think, of parenting and teaching is about giving advice, giving answers. How do I tie my shoes? How do I tell time? We're the experts. And this is an opportunity to think with your child, with your student. We don't have the answers to a lot of these questions any more than the child does. We might have greater conceptual sophistication. We might have greater, more language, linguistic skill. We might have more, obviously, have more life experience. But they also bring to the table a lot of skill, a freshness of perspective, and openness about thinking about possibilities, et cetera. So I think part of this is really being willing to just engage in a conversation just like you would with another adult mm -hmm. without always thinking you have to be teaching and there has to be something the child is learning etc cetera, etc cetera. and that is very different than saying when your child says something like you know i think about like what is it what is real if your response is going to be well let me tell you about plato's view of the forms and what plato thought about your child's <laughs> going to think okay i don't want to get mom started on this you know this is not interesting to me and maybe at some point the child if they're particularly philosophically inclined will get interested in reading philosophy that's great but that's not really what we're talking about here mm -hmm. what we're talking about is just engaging with the child in these larger conversations so I was going to save this question for later, but I think what you just said uh, is very apropos to Albert's Impossible mm. Toothache, which I bought yes. as a result of reading your work. What is Albert's Impossible Toothache? So share. Albert, Albert is a turtle who one day announces that he has a toothache and his family are quite incredulous because, of course, turtles don't have teeth. And so they wonder why Albert is making up such stories. And they are really not very supportive of Albert other than to say, you know, could you please knock it off? And finally, towards the end of the story, his grandmother comes to visit. And she is the first one to ask him, Albert, where is your toothache? And he tells her it is in the place where a gopher bit him, which I've come to think is in some ways, it is a toothache. The ache was caused by a tooth, not Albert's tooth, but the gopher's tooth. <laughs> and what's so interesting about the story is, I mean, it raises a lot of questions about sort of, you know, categorization and language, but, mm. but most, most of the time that I read it with children, what they want to talk about is why doesn't anyone believe Albert? <coughs> and why doesn't anyone talk to Albert about what it is he's trying to communicate? And I always ask them, do you think the story would be different if it were Albert's mother who was saying she mm. had a toothache? And they say, oh, yeah, it would be completely different because people would actually think, well, why is she saying that in a way they don't when it's a child? Yeah, I love that story and i love your explanation and and insights on it and i i think it's just inc it was such a exemplar of this very ethic that so many people are so dismissive of children's questions and it just takes that that brief moment uh that ethic and this particular idea i think um is part of what you write about with i think it was carol um gilligan's uh, mm -hmm. argument about a care orientation. Now now we're getting to some more of the meat of why doing this kind of philosophy with philosophy with children is so critically important. Um, on page 26 of Seen and Not Heard, you write, Carol uh, Gilligan argues that early childhood experiences of attachment have significant moral implications because these experiences generate a perspective on relationships that underlies the conception of morality as love. In her view, a care orientation is an important lens from which to approach moral decision making. In contrast to more traditional philosophical conceptions of morality that stress the importance of universal rules, rights, and principles, a care orientation emphasizes caring relationships and love. I was really moved by this because what you 
did in this work is you connected this approach of doing philosophy with kids, not just as an intellectual exercise, which I what we think about, right? When I think about philosophy, I think this is purely an intellectual in, in exercise. But by doing all the things that you just mentioned, we are actually creating a completely different kind of emotional set with kids. So I think I just, I don't know if I have a question in there. I just loved, maybe I'll do, just do that. I'll just read all your book back to you because it, it's just really, <laughs> really wonderful. More that you want to share on that. Am I missing some particular pieces or anything else? To... No, I mean, I do think part of that is recognizing the strength of being vulnerable. One of the reasons that children are often dismissed or seen as sort of secondary human beings, you know, becomings as opposed to full human beings, is because they're vulnerable, they're dependent on others. Mm. And one of the things that Gilligan's work points to is this vulnerability is, in also, is also a strength because it's at the core of our relational interactions, and, and which really is at the core of ethics. I mean, ultimately, what is ethics about other than how we treat one another? Mm. And if we start with these early feelings of attachment and connection and obligation to family members, this is what results in us becoming moral adults eventually. I mean, when you ask children who what's most important in your life, they invariably will say family. I mean, that's the number one answer that I hear. And then mm. friends, but it's all it's relationships. Mm. Fantastic. I, I just am so moved by by that connection and I hope that more people would understand um, that this kind of posture is so good for the mind, but also good for the heart and the soul. Uh, along those same lines, you write about some practical effects of doing this. So, for example, um, I, you mentioned that it's important to not be in a rush when doing mm -hmm. this kind of conversation. So philosophy forces us in many ways to slow down and to take time and to be a part of the moment that is uh, that is happening there. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about some of these practical uh, effects, slowing down empathy. Yeah, I mean, I do think, I mean, this and this connects to what you said a little bit earlier about sort of the emotional dimension of this work. And that is that when you're engaged in talking with someone or a group of children about, you know, the nature of love, for example, what does it mean to love? You're, you're both thinking using our, our sort of intellectual capacities to reason through these questions, but we're also talking from our own experiences. And what we think about these questions is actually very personal. It really, it really sort of um, illuminates who we are as people. And so it, it is both sort of very absorbing. You're kind of in this conversation with each other. I mean, it's interesting when I'm in a school, say, say older kids in middle school or high school, and my, and my undergraduate students as well, people aren't looking at their phones. People are really in it together. Mm -hmm. And there really is, I think, a hunger for that, especially in the moment we're living in, where there's, a, there's just constant distraction. And it doesn't really feed us, right? I mean, we, we really do, I think, benefit from having opportunities to slow down and to just be in a space of thinking with other people that is meaningful to us about questions that matter to us mm. that we care about. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is why people are flocking to yoga and meditation, and we're 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 searching for these kinds of avenues. I believe. Yeah, it's <coughs> so sorry. I don't know where this cough is coming from. It's okay. <clears throat> um, it, it sounds very much like the term reflective intimacy that you write about, um, page 124 and 25. You say, the experience of authentically striving together to understand an issue or analyze a problem creates a space for reflective intimacy. Um, exactly. It's it That really touches me because I feel like, especially as somebody who's who feels like I'm in my head all the time and, uh, and an introvert, um, 
introverts like solitude, but we don't like isolation, right? We still need yep. community and connection, right? We're still social beings at the core of it. How we find that social sociality is, is different, of course, from extroverts. Uh, but reflective mm -hmm. intimacy was really uh, an incredibly wonderful term that I absolutely loved. And sort of connected to that, one of the things I talk about sometimes is the important of, importance in these sessions of being comfortable with silence, being comfortable with spaces where, where people are just thinking. Mm -hmm. And because not everyone is quick to jump in with, with an expression of their thoughts. Some people need more space and time to just mull over it before they're ready to express themselves and giving everyone that kind of opportunity so that we all, if there's silence, you know how that is. Often if you're in a group and there's silence, someone feels like, okay, I got to say something because this is really <laughs> uncomfortable. <clears throat> but actually when you start to create a, an environment where people are comfortable with that, it really, it does slow things down, but it also makes room for more people mm. to be able to engage in whatever way is works for them. Mm. Yeah. I'm just going to not say anything now. <laughs> I love it. Um, related to that is this paradox that I also found in your work, which is very similar to a previous question, but it's a little bit different, is that um, philosophy is very open-ended. But you also encourage, very practically speaking, to give children a sense of closure and a sense of accomplishment. Um, talk us through... What does giving children a sense of closure and accomplishment, why is it important? How do you do it? And how does that work with the idea that philosophy is supposed to be open-ended and unresolved? Another great question. Um, and I think that one of the reasons closure is important is because philosophy is unresolved. We don't leave the conversation about friendship with sort of, okay, now I know what friendship means. I know what it means to be a friend. Done. I can move on to the next topic, right? We're going to leave it with, with still lots of questions, lots of ways of looking at it. Um, and, and that can feel, especially for some children, a little, we want them to develop a comfort with uncertainty, but we don't want them to feel like there's no point. They ha we haven't gone anywhere. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do that, just in, practically speaking. One is to do some kind of creative um, uh, closure activity. So sometimes with kids, if it was friendship, for example, I might say, okay, let's write a group poem. Everyone write a line that starts with, you know, a friend is or whatever. Um, or we might do it with younger kids, maybe drawing. But often what I'll do is just sort of map out for the students where the conversation has gone. Mm -hmm. So we started off asking this question and then all these different ways of looking at friendship emerged, right? Oh, you know, it started with, oh, a friend, someone you have fun with. And then someone else said, yeah, but sometimes you have fun with people and they're not very nice to you. Mm -hmm. So are they really friends and et cetera, et cetera. And so we, this is kind of how we started to think about it. And these are the other questions that came up. So I'm demonstrating for the students that we've made progress in this conversation. Yeah. Our thinking has deepened. We understand the, maybe the conception of friendship better. Even though we're not going to resolve the question, what does it mean to be a friend? We actually have a much better understanding of both the question and many ways of thinking about it. Yeah. And so that's, that's, I think, important for them to feel like this is serving a purpose for them and seeing the kinds of conceptual progress that mm. they've made. Yeah. I'm wondering if an, another kind of uh, evidence, piece of evidence of that is the next question. Like... Um, Right. When you ask the first question, you, you sometimes don't know what you're asking. You're just trying to grasp at some sort of curiosity. You get, quote unquote, an answer or a response to that question, but that doesn't resolve any issue. That only says, that only evokes within you. Well, now I've got like five more questions. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And that can be helpful to know, especially if the questions, I mean, one of the things we we are helping the children to learn is how to ask good questions, how to ask questions that really get at what it is you're <clears throat> wanting to learn or know. Oh man. So right there, well, all of this <clears throat> is what I feel is so critically important for our current cultural moment of vitriol and opinionations yeah. and um, lobbying for ideas and, and absolute narcissistic, you know, uh, epistemic narcissism, shall we call or whatever. Um, I feel like just that level of uh, 
humility is just so critically needed. So that's why I love this work that you're doing and wish more people would do it. Um, I want to shift for kind of the closing part of the conversation towards a little bit of the future because you, what's, uh, again, I loved everything. You also connect philosophy with hope, mm -hmm. which I thought was just, again, really wonderful because it, it sound everything that you wrote about seems counterintuitive because like when I think about philosophers, I think about people who wrestle with these existential questions and then all of a sudden fall into this demise of like, oh, woe is me or the world. I've now discovered how, you know, inane or the, the entropic death of the universe is going to destroy <laughs> us all. Talk to us about why or, or what is your argument that philosophy actually leads us to hope? Well, I mean, I think that hope involves kind of creative thinking, right? It, it involves being willing to look at a possible future and being confident that you can actually have control over that future, right? That, that, the, that, you, that you can make happen the things that you would really like to happen yeah. in your life. And I think that thinking philosophically and especially with others can open the door to you both being confident that you can ask the right question, but, but also that the way you see the world, that your, your perspective, how, how your judgments, how the world appears to you is really valuable hmm. and that you can trust your own questions and ideas and perspectives, which doesn't mean that you shouldn't be open to listening to others. But I think that actually the more confident you are in your own perspective, the more open you are to listening to hmm. others because you're willing, you want it, you want that perspective to be enriched and it becomes more about sort of, Learn, learning as much as you can. Mm. And I think that there is a lot of hope in that, um, a lot of ability to think that the future is within your grasp, I guess yeah. you might yeah. say. Yeah, you also write about how philosophy uh, gives us a sense of self-directed learning, creativity. It opens up all these other avenues and doors. And, and, and mm. those those are all part of that uh, envisioning a different, a different kind of future. I, I heard this quote many years ago, and I, I apologize, I don't know the exact source of it, but it was uh, something along the lines of those who do not do philosophy are those who are most bound by it. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that doing philosophy is a way of liberation. I, I'm kind of curious with your PhD in philosophy, what what is your take on that statement? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, think I think it's think connected I, in some ways to this yeah, question. I, no, I, <clears throat> I mean, I think the idea, the way I, I would understand that state that that perspective or that that statement is that we are all um, constrained by certain social constructions right certain ways of seeing the world we come into the world and we and we learn all kinds of ideas some things then we believe right some of our beliefs come because that's what we were taught we don't we i mean it would be impossible to question every belief we were taught right so so we build these beliefs as we grow up and the more that you're able to really think about all the beliefs you have really question them really think about the other ways you might see them or why you think them in the first place i mean sometimes philosophy can help to strengthen your own beliefs because you understand better why you have them. And there are other beliefs that you might decide, wow, maybe, maybe, maybe that's not, I wasn't quite right about that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't engage in philosophical thinking, if you don't question those beliefs, then you're just bound by what you were taught. Mm -hmm. Right. And so philosophy, I mean, because whether we think philosophy as a discipline is important or not, philosophical constructs and ideas govern so many aspects of our lives right yeah and, and the uh, absence of personal interrogation is what gets us into trouble right absolutely you know as you were oh go ahead you're gonna i mean i was just gonna say socrates said the unexamined life is not worth yeah. living right yeah. that's that's really the idea 
Yeah. One, one of the most kind of um, visceral and explicit examples of that was your reference to John Cage's four minutes and 33, four minutes and 33 seconds, which, by the way, mm -hmm. I, I watched the whole thing and it was the longest four minutes and 33 <laughs> seconds of my life. Tell us what 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 is that? And then uh, I would be kind of curious your take on that. Then third question. Sorry, I'm, I'm stacking them in here. How would you use that as an example for teaching philosophy to kids? Oh, yeah, I can tell you stories about how I have. So four minutes and 33 seconds is a very famous composition written by the composer John Cage, who was making a really posing a question about the nature of music. So it's four minutes and 33 seconds. It is scored for what the pianist should do lifting the lid, lowering the lid of the piano, etc. But it's totally silent. There's no music, so there's no sound. And the really, he called it a listening exercise because what happens when you are in a place where someone's performing four minutes and 33 seconds is you hear all kinds of things you wouldn't otherwise hear. Yeah. The sound of the heat pump, the sound of, you know, whatever, right? A bird outside, et cetera, et cetera. The way I've used this, I've done it in a number of different ways, but one of the best ways that I've done it is I've actually had a pianist come to the school. We've met in the music room and I say, you know, we're going to have we're going to do a philosophy session and this is going to be the prompt. And the pianist sits down and does this four minutes and 33 seconds. And I've done this with like fourth graders. Oh, and wow. They, they are probably in some ways better than adults about it. I mean, they just sort of sit there and they're trying to figure out what on earth is going on well you wrote and about how like one of the one of the performances like people just got up and left they were like what the well, heck when he is this? the first time this was performed which was i think in new york somewhere years in the 50s people were booing and hissing and la i mean it was mm, really uh, wow, quite wow. people were not happy but what this does is it really does in this very kind of powerful way raise these questions about so what is music hmm. and and is can anything be music i mean i remember one of the times i did it one of the one of the, i think it was a fourth grader said when, when asked you know what after it and i'll say to the students so what did you think what would what did you think was happening and and one of the students said i thought maybe she, she the pianist was having an anxiety attack hmm. and like couldn't it was really interesting right but they talk about yeah. what they hear how they they hear all these vibrations in the room and and and, and it's it's very interesting it's a very interesting and and sort of it really grabs everyone's attention so yeah. it's kind of a nice prompt for that yeah. um but yeah it's it's it and it, it is a really interesting thing to think about like I mean, because once you start to ask the question, what makes something music? What can count as music and what can't? It it's it it can <laughs> you find that it's way more confusing than you might have thought it was. Yeah, that's fantastic. I I um I love it. I love <laughs> it's so fantastic. <laughs> I I wish I. Well, next time you come to our school, I want to be in the room when that happens because I think that would yeah. just that would delight me to no end. Um, <laughs> okay, let's let's uh, put a bow on all of this. <clears throat> uh, I would like to get your work out there more. I want more people, more schools, more parents, educators to be a part of this. What is Plato? <laughs> First of all, I need to figure out how to ask that question because I've mentioned your organization <laughs> to a couple of people. It's like, of course, I know what Plato is. Uh, so what what is Plato and what is it exactly that you do? Uh, and then I'll have one more closing question for you. Okay, so Plato stands for Philosophy, Learning, and Teaching Organization, and that is exactly what we do. We learn together, we teach people, so we have a multitude of programs both in schools, in communities, and online for educators, for parents, grandparents, and for students. We run classes for all levels of students, and we do lots of different kinds of workshops and webinars and roundtables and other online training and in-person training programs for both classroom teachers and other educators who are interested in children's philosophical thinking. We have a website that has a lot of open access resources, including lots of references for picture books and other literature and other kinds of um, prompts for inspiring philosophical conversations, both at home with your own children and in classrooms. 
and we have some publications. We have two journals and a blog, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot, and almost everything is on the on the website and completely open access. Um, there's a wealth of resources there. And we work with educators and students around the country and as well as internationally, really to try and have more and more people become aware of how powerful this work is both for teachers and for their students. How long have you guys been around and do you have any kind of long term analysis as to what the work is actually doing um, as kids grow older? Yeah, there. I mean, there, there haven't been any good longitudinal longitudinal studies in this country. Um, there was one in Spain that looked at that question. Uh, I think, I mean, one of the challenges with those kinds of measurements is what exactly are we measuring right, and how right. do we measure it? Uh, so what, but we do know that in the classrooms where we are engaged in kind of a long-term project to do philosophy, a number of schools where we have philosophy throughout the school and students have it multiple years, if not every year. And the teachers invariably do point out, especially on some of the state's tests, et cetera, that their students, the students who've had philosophy for that long, are just particularly good at both questioning and um, reasoning and also at communication skills, mm -hmm. being able to sort of express both in orally and in writing their points of view and to also spot issues very clearly. So to be able to look at a paragraph and kind of see what the central question might be, because that's so much of what we do in philosophy. Yeah, right? yeah, it's fantastic. I'm going to close with the question that you posed in your book, Seen and Not Heard, page seven, uh, or sorry, The Philosophical Child, page seven. How might society benefit if children were widely recognized as independent thinkers, capable of seeing clearly and contributing in valuable ways to our world? How would children's lives change if what they said was not often ignored or patronized? Give us your summation to the question that you posed. How might society benefit and how would children's lives actually change? Yeah, well, I think society would benefit because we would have a whole generation of young people whose voices would become part of important conversations and are now neglected. People who have a fresh perspective, new ideas, are not sort of burdened by this is the way it has to be, this is the way it always has been, but are open to thinking about possibilities that are new. Um, I also think that it would allow adults to be maybe more deeply connected to that part of themselves, the part of us that in childhood was full of curiosity and wonder and openness, mm -hmm. and um, that that would make maybe for more open and connected and kind interchange among us um, on a sort of collective level. For children, I think it's pretty self-explanatory that if you're a child and what you say is taken up and you think that what you think and question has value, is important to the people around you and that you're contributing to important conversations, that's pretty empowering. Yeah, yeah. Okay, my friends, philosophy is not just an academic ivory tower exercise. It is the very impulse of curiosity that exists within us all. Can you imagine what would happen as Janice so wonderfully articulated with our society and our children if we allowed philosophy to live and to thrive in that particular way? It creates this wonderful care orientation, this beautiful sense of epistemic humility, the sense of uh, identity and who we are, better thinking, creativity, and yes, even hope and empathy in the world. The book is not Albert's Impossible Toothache, although you should definitely get that one. But the books are Seen and Not Heard. I should have said this at the very beginning, uh, wonderful testimonies uh, from actual kids in this book. So I loved reading the actual students' words and their reflections and the um, wonderful articulation of everything that we've talked about here, The Philosophical Child by Jana Moore Lone.
oh, how I wish more people would do this. And I hope that more people would get on board with uh, what Plato is doing. And I just wish you all the best. And I'm so grateful that you exist. And uh, may your tribe expand and influence more and more in the world. Jana, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation tonight. We thank so you for it. having me. It was delightful. Thanks. All right. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.